Good morning, and welcome to our second week of uh, having our service online. Uh, we're so glad that you were able to join us as we worship our Lord and Savior this morning. And again, I want to give you greetings from the people that are here. Ben is at the back recording. I've got Barb on the organ, and today we have Rick, who's going to read uh, the scripture to us later in the service. Uh, just before we begin, I want to make a couple, make a couple announcements again. Um, the first is that we have a couple new additions this week um, compared to last week. Uh, so this week, um, we have a few more things uh, for families. So uh, families, um, there will be a kid's song, a link to a kid's song uh, later in the service um, that your kids can do some actions to and have some fun with. Um, so be sure to look for the link for that underneath um, this video. Also, um, we, are, we have a... Um, Kids Adventure Time video that uh, Joanna Richards has prepared uh, for the kids to watch as part of a lesson for them. Uh, and you can access that video um, on Facebook. So if you go to Facebook and go to the Elk Lake Baptist Church uh, group, um, you will find the lesson posted there. And uh, you can do that with your kids. And I'll give you a nod later in the service when might be a good t t time to do that. Um, and also, just a little helpful thing with navigating is um, if you want to uh, get to the songs or some other link and come back to the same place, uh, when you go to click on the link underneath, if you hold the control button, which is the bottom left button on your keyboard, while you click it, it'll open in a new tab. And then that way you don't have to hit the back button or anything, you can just switch between tabs. Uh, you could even set that up, pause the button right now and set it up um, right now to have all your videos and stuff ready to go at the proper time if you wish. Anyway, uh, one last thing I want to say before we begin, and that is I want to give a special thanks to Maureen and all those who contributed donations to our place. Uh, when she left here, she had a, the back of her van was full, which was such a great blessing, and uh, it uh, brought the people, she said the people that she gave, dropped it off to at the received it were crying because it was so very much needed and uh, they were just overwhelmed with how much we were able to bring to them. So thank you very much for making that uh, contribution and taking the time and effort to do that to all of you. All right, let's begin. Uh, this morning we're gonna open with a call to worship that comes from Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself, like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that on account of your great power and your great love, that we can rest in you, that we can be like that little child that is filled and satisfied and resting in its mother's arms. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would grant us that peace by the power of your Holy Spirit, both now and always. Amen. So we are going to begin by singing a hymn. We're going to sing the hymn, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. And you should be able to see the words on your screen when it comes up. This is, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place.
Would you please bow with me in prayer? O living God, God of eternity, when the voice of the prophet was silent and the faith of your people low, when darkness had obscured light and indifference had displaced zeal, you saw that the time was right and prepared to send your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would forgive us our sins and set us free from fear and faithlessness that we may be ready to welcome him who comes as Savior and Lord. Amen. It is written, If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our faith, my brothers and sisters, in the, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. May you rest assured that in him your sins are forgiven and you are safe and secure. Amen. At this time, if you would like to uh, join in the singing of some contemporary worship songs, um, we invite you to click, control click, the link uh, that is below this video, and that will lead you to a set of songs that you can sing with. Um, if after that time you would also like to uh, sing a kit song with your kids with some actions, uh, there's another link to that one which you can also control click. Um, so you can pause this video now and sing those songs, and then when you come back, uh, we'll continue um, with the, our service. Welcome back. Uh, now we would like to uh, move to the prayers of our community. And uh, when we pray this prayer, I'm again, I'm going to make only a couple requests that I'll lift forward into prayer to start the prayer. And then after that, I will give you a moment uh, where I invite you to offer your prayers, at which time I uh, suggest you pause the video, um, pray w uh, yourself or with whoever you might be with, uh, and then restart the video and continue with the service. So would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are the one who can save. And Heavenly Father, we come to you because we know you are good and that you are the one who makes us secure and safe. And so, Heavenly Father, we now lift up to, the, to you the vulnerable people in our community. Heavenly Father, we think of the people who rely so heavenly on the ministries of places like the Mustard Seed and Our Place, people who do not have places to stay and do not have um, steady supplies of food. Heavenly Father, in this time where extra precautions are being taken and where it's not as easy to get things to these people, we pray that you'd have special concern for them, that you would watch out over them, that you would lead them to places where they can find what they need, and that you would shelter them with your grace and your love. Heavenly Father, we also want to lift up those who are working in hospitals and in different um, stores, grocery stores, drug stores, other places that need to stay open, Father. We pray your special hand of protection over them and their families. We pray that you'd give them joy as they serve and um, sustain us as a community. And we pray that you'd give them peace. Lord, we also pray for those who have been ordered to stop working. Lord, we recognize that this is having a big impact on many families, that there are a lot of concerns over how bills are going to get paid and that sort of thing. And so, Heavenly Father, we just ask um, for peace and assurance for them, that they would know that you will provide and that they will be able to trust you and that you would stir your people when they see people in need, that they would be stirred to give and to share what they have. We ask these things in your name, Father, and now we take time to lift up our own requests to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know all things and that you see all things, and we thank you that we are in your hands. We pray that you would lead us and guide us by the power of your Holy Spirit 
to the glory of your name, both now and forevermore. Amen. So at this time, um, if you're a family with kids watching and you feel like you'd want to uh, do this lesson with the kids that Joanna's prepared, I encourage you to, again, hit the pause button and go and do with that with your kids, and then uh, feel free to come back and join us when you're done. And at this time, I'm going to invite Rick forward, and he's going to read this morning's scripture reading for us. Good morning, Elk Lake, Elk Lake Baptist community. The scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 22, under the section heading, The Last Supper. And I'll be reading verses 14 to 20. Luke 22, beginning at verse 20. Sorry, beginning at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that in your mercy and grace, you would now open these words to us, that we might comprehend with our minds and respond in faith with our hearts, so that you can fill us, renew us, and lead us in the way of life everlasting. We ask this in the name of your Son and for the further fame of his name. Amen. We are vulnerable. As much as we might wish or pretend that it isn't true, we are. We can go from riches to rags, from success to failure. We can be rejected and abandoned and ridiculed. We can be injured. We can become sick. And our suffering can go on and on without relief. And when all is said and done, if the Lord is yet to return, we will die. We are vulnerable. And with, vulnerable, with vulnerability comes fear. There is no way around it. So when something like the current coronavirus pandemic comes and vulnerability increases, fear increases with it. Fear for our lives or the lives of our loved ones. Fear over how we're going to pay the bills now that so many of us have ordered, been ordered to stop working. And these are not irrational fears. Even if the measures that the government has taken bring a speedy end to the COVID-19 virus, people have died, and people still will. And some businesses will not survive, and they will leave people without of work and unable to pay the bills. Bad things are happening, and it is no help to pretend like they're not. What is helpful is to learn what to do with our fear. Vulnerability has increased, and fear has increased too. So what should we do with our fear? Well, it just so happens that the text read to us this morning gives us the opportunity to look at Jesus and to see how he faced his fear. In Luke chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, we read that when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus is fully aware that he is about to suffer and die. 
In fact, he's aware that this will be his very last meal before he suffers and dies. And yet listen again to his words. He says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover. More than the Passover meal that came the year before or the year before that, more than every other meal he's ever eaten before this, Jesus has eagerly desired to eat this meal, the meal on the night of his crucifixion. Now, this does not sound like the response we would expect from a man on death row. It seems unthinkable that any person on death row would sincerely claim that their last meal, right before their execution, was the meal they looked forward to the most in their life. That of all the meals that they have eaten and shared with family or friends, that the night before their death was their most anticipated meal. And I think we expect the same from Jesus. In fact, I think we expect more. I mean, wouldn't it make more sense if Jesus had said these words about the meal that he ate with his apostles on the beach after he had been raised from the dead, after the suffering and death was all over? I mean, wouldn't he more, be more excited about that meal? I, I kind of think I would be. But Jesus doesn't say these words about that meal. He says these words about this meal about the Passover meal that he eats immediately before he suffers and dies. The meal where he has more reason to be afraid than any other meal in his entire life. And yet Jesus is being truthful and sincere here. Facing imminent betrayal and death, Jesus is truly delighted to be sharing this meal with his apostles. In fact, he's been eagerly looking forward to it. Why? I mean, why hasn't the fear drowned out every positive emotion in him? How is he feeling such delight in the face of imminent death? Why is Jesus eagerly desiring to eat what should be the most fearful meal of his life? Well, Jesus gives us his answer in verse 16. Starting our reading in verse 15 and carrying on, we read the following. It says, Jesus said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Why? For, or because, I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Why is Jesus not overwhelmed by fear in the face of suffering and death? Well, because Jesus is certain that there is something in the future that will make everything right. Or to sum it up in one word, Jesus had hope. And where there is hope, fear never wins. Now, don't get me wrong, Jesus still felt fear. He was not fearless, at least not in the literal sense of that word. This is made perfectly clear by the fact that Luke will write only a few verses later in chapter 22 about how in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So Jesus was not spared the intensity of fear that comes before suffering and death. He experienced it to the full, just as we do. But Jesus had a hope that was so deep and profound that he was not ruled by that fear. In fact, his hope was so powerful that at the Last Supper, he felt a joy that was greater than his fear, a delight that drowned out even the dread of death. So Jesus wasn't lying when he told us, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover He felt fear, but he had hope too, and that made all the difference. He was certain that his suffering and death was not the end. Now at this point, I think it's important for us to pause and clarify what we mean by the word hope. For as Gordon Smith has pointed out aptly, uh, people often confuse, he writes, people often confuse hope with wishful thinking. We say things like, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. Or, I hope I can get married and have kids and get a job and have a great retirement. Or, to apply this concretely to to today, we say things like, I hope the coronavirus will be all gone by the end of April. And it feels nice to make wishes like this. But wishful thinking is not hope. In fact, if we truly put our hope in wishful thinking, all we are really doing is setting ourselves up for disillusionment and despair. I want you to listen to this carefully, my brothers and sisters. 
if we look to wishes, wishes like the coronavirus won't be that bad and the economy will simply bounce back, if we look to wishes to comfort us and calm our fears, then we should not expect to share in the joy of Jesus Christ. If we look to wishful thinking to solve our fear, we should not expect to experience the joy of Jesus in the face of that fear. What we should expect is a period of shallow optimism, most likely followed by collapse into a deep and dark cynicism. You see, when we remain healthy and ignore the suffering of others and parrot the words of our leaders who say, we will all get through this, it can feel like things are really going to be okay. But that kind of shallow optimism is a flimsy defense against any sort of real suffering or hardship. And so when any kind of real suffering comes, it feels like total betrayal. We can say, we will all get through this until grandpa dies. And we can say, we will all get through this until the family business goes bankrupt. And that's when the disillusionment and cynicism sets in. You see, most, and perhaps even all, of our disillusionment with God rests on treating our own wishes, our wishful thinking, as if it were hope. We wish for success, and for peace, and for freedom, and for happiness. We wish for blissful marriages, and perfect health, and long life for us and all whom we love. And we assume that a good God would give us what we wish for. But God has not promised us any of these things in this life. Let me say that again. In this life, God has not promised us any of these things. Therefore, if we use wishes like that to try and combat our fear, we should be more afraid than we already are because we actually have no real hope. Wishful thinking gets us nowhere. It is simply a setup for disillusionment and despair. For Jesus has promised us that in this world you will have trouble. John chapter 16, verse 33. Putting our hope in wishing away the troubles in this life is no hope at all. It is guaranteed to fail. Jesus himself promises that it will. So don't go looking to your wishes for what might happen in this life to combat your fear. Don't go wishing for better jobs or better relationships or better whatever you want to say. As a method for getting past fear, it won't work in the end. It ends in disillusionment, not in joy. But Jesus had real hope and real joy. Jesus' hope was not based on wishing away suffering in this life. As we remember again, he said in verse 15, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. In other words, Jesus was willing to accept and endure the suffering that lay before him because he had a reason to. Because he knew that that suffering and death would not be his end. In full knowledge then of his imminent suffering and death, Jesus declares that that at the end of the age, when the kingdom of God has come, he will eat again, in verse 16, and that he will drink again, in verse 18. Even though the suffering and death that faces him will be hard, he knows that it is a brief and small price to pay in in comparison with the true end that awaits him, life forever in the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus knew not only that he would suffer and die, he also knew that his death was not the end and that his true end was good. Very, very good. And that is what real hope is. It is not wishful thinking. It is confidence that whatever may happen in this life, the ending will be good. Very, very good. Now you might say, well, that's all fine and dandy for Jesus. I mean, he is God and he knows all things. Of course he is certain about what's coming in the future and he had that kind of hope. But what about us? How can we have that kind of hope? Well, this turns out to be one of the major meanings and purposes 
of the Lord's Supper. This meal that Jesus so eagerly looked forward to. Luke, in his record of it, leaves it implicit in the words of Jesus recorded here. But Matthew remembers Jesus making it explicit when he was with Jesus at the Last Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, Jesus is recorded as saying, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you, with you in my Father's kingdom. Therefore, if Jesus speaks the mind of God, which he most certainly does, then Jesus is declaring that every disciple who dines with him, who shares in this meal, will be with him in his Father's kingdom at the end of the age. In other words, the act of faith in Jesus, symbolically played out in the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup at the Lord's table, means that Jesus' hope is now our hope too. Jesus' certainty about his own future applies with equal certainty to our future. If Jesus will be there at the end, which he certainly will be, then everyone who comes to faith in him, comes in faith to him, the faith that is expressed in participating in the Lord's Supper, every one of those people will be with him in the end, on the last day. Jesus' hope is now our hope. His certainty is now our certainty. You see, we do not know what will happen with the COVID-19 virus, how many or will die, or how much damage it will do to the economy and our ability to earn and provide for our families. Predictions about such things are speculation, wishful thinking. But continue to put your faith in Jesus. Continue to come to him, to receive the bread and the cup in faith, and this is certain. You will eat and drink with him again in the coming kingdom of God. As we have learned over the course of this series, the Lord's Supper is not an ordinary meal. It is a symbolic act that has been filled with meaning by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's the Lord's Supper. And therefore it is an act where all are invited by him to come. And where those who respond and come in faith receive from him. Receive from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the one who is the host of the meal. And as we come to him, we learn what we've been receiving that he gives to us remembrance of him. That is, all that he has won back then and there on the cross, he is applying to us and to our lives now. That in receiving the bread and the cup, in faith we receive his forgiveness. We enter into a new covenant. We receive the joy of thanksgiving and the nourishment of eternal life. All of this is symbolically represented in the meal that we now call the Lord's Supper. And all of it is received by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ alone. But the meaning of the Lord's Supper would be incomplete if we forgot these words of Jesus at the table, which speak of the future, of the day when we will all eat and drink together with Jesus in the kingdom of God. For we not only receive forgiveness and new covenant and communion and thanksgiving and nourishment, we also receive hope. The very same hope that belonged to Jesus Christ and made him steadfast and joyful, even in the face of death. The promise of Jesus that we will be with him in the end. My brothers and sisters, this is very good news. It provides certainty in an otherwise unpredictable world. It gives us hope to face all of our fears. But as that is most certainly true, This doesn't quite fully answer the question why that particular Passover meal, that one right before Jesus' death, the one where Jesus established what we call the Lord's Supper for the very first time, why that meal was Jesus' all-time looked-forward-to meal. And we may not know that answer for certain, but Jesus did give us enough information to make a very good guess. You see, in all three Gospels that record what Jesus said at the meal that we call the Last Supper, Jesus makes a very striking and forceful claim about the cup. We find these words recorded in Matthew 26, verse 29, Mark 14, verse 25, and here in Luke 22, verse 18, 
where Jesus says, For I tell you, I will not, in fact it says, I will certainly not, drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. The question is, why does Jesus make such a big deal about emphasizing that he will not drink from the fruit of the vine again until the end, until the coming of the kingdom? And another question added to that is that why do all three gospel writers feel this is so important that they all record it? I mean, they don't all record the words, do this in remembrance of me. Only Luke records that and Paul later in, in 1 Corinthians. Um, but they all record this saying. Why is it so important? Well, it's not because Jesus thinks we should stop drinking wine and start drinking juice. The best and only explanation I have found has to do with the fact that, as far as we know, there were four cups of wine served at the Passover meal. Two spread apart before the eating of the meal, the lamb, and two spread apart after the meal. And when Jesus took his vow of abstaining from ever drinking from wine again, most people believe he spoke that in reference to the third cup. Matthew and Mark record Jesus saying his vow of abstinence after supper, we're told, which is the timing of the third cup, as far as we know. And Luke records the vow of abstinence before that, before the meal, which may refer to the second cup, but because Jesus says, take this and divide it among you, instead of the words, drink it, drink from it, all of you, which we find in Matthew about the third cup, uh, many believe that the cup was simply prepared. It was divided, passed out in, uh, beforehand, and that Jesus is still talking about the third cup here. In other words, most people are convinced that Jesus' words, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes, were spoken in reference to the third cup. Now, why am I telling you this? <laughs> right? Why am I telling you this? Well, because if Jesus spoke his vow over the third cup, then he didn't drink the fourth cup. In other words, Jesus never finished the Passover meal, which we call the Last Supper. Or more accurately, Jesus was extending the meal, declaring that the meal would not be over until he drank that fourth cup in the kingdom of God at the end of the age. As William Lane comments, the drinking of the third cup, which is called the cup of redemption, strengthened, he says, by the vow of abstinence of Jesus, constitutes the solemn pledge that the fourth cup will be extended and the unfinished meal completed in the consummation when Messiah eats with redeemed sinners in the kingdom of God. In other words, there are not many instances of Lord's suppers, many suppers that have happened again and again and again over the past 2,000 years. There is only one Lord's Supper, one meal that was started by Jesus on the night before his death and will continue until he returns and it becomes the final and eternal banquet feast in the kingdom of God. Therefore, the Last Supper is called the Last Supper for a reason. It was the beginning of the great banquet which will not reach its fulfillment until Christ returns and we are all eating and drinking together with him in the kingdom of God. And every celebration of what we now call the Lord's Supper is simply a continuation of that one still unfinished meal. When we drink the cup, we're drinking the third cup again and again and again. So when you come to the Lord's table, my brothers and sisters, as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, you are joining the very same meal that Jesus began with the 12 apostles sitting around the table on the night before he died. Jesus has not finished the meal, and he will not do so until all who believe are safely with him in the new heavens and the new earth at the wedding feast of the Lamb. Then and only then will Jesus drink from the fourth cup, the cup of consummation, and now we can see why Jesus so eagerly desired to eat the Last Supper with his disciples. You see, when sin separated us from God back in the Garden of Eden, we often think 
about what a devastating loss that was for us as human beings. What we often fail to see is what a devastating loss it was for God. It is true that God does not need us. But like a father or mother longs for reconciliation with an estranged child, so God longs for us, his people. After thousands of years of estrangement, of being separated from his children, God, in the person of Jesus Christ, on the night of the Last Supper, finally got to sit down and have dinner with his kids. The Lord's Supper is about receiving. It's about receiving grace, undeserved forgiveness and transformation and joy and consummation, nourishment and a hope that drives out fear. But why would God give us sinners so many undeserved gifts, so much grace? Because God loves us, my brothers and sisters. Because long before any of us had any desire to or longing to sit down and eat with him, God desired and longed to sit down and eat with us, to be with us. In fact, God longed to be reconciled with us so passionately that he didn't even wait until we had been fully transformed into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ, to eat with us. As soon as Jesus' path to the cross was set to commitment by Judas's betrayal of him, as soon as he was set on that path to reconciliation in a firm way, God began the Last Supper, the meal that symbolizes our new communion, our new intimacy with God on account of Jesus' death, an intimacy that will only grow until it reaches its height, the height of its fulfillment, in the wedding supper of Jesus the Lamb, the one who was slain for us. And therefore, the Lord's Supper is a symbolic act that is filled with meaning by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the place where we remember him, where we are forgiven and renew the covenant, where we receive joy to give thanks to God, communion with him and each other, nourishment and a hope that conquers fear. It is a place where we receive the grace of God by faith through physically tangible acts, the eating of bread and the drinking of the cup. And it is the place where we receive the grace of God by faith because at its very core, it is the symbol of God's love for us. The symbol that reminds us that Jesus' favorite meal the meal he eagerly desired to eat was the meal where for the first time in history, those who ate it in faith were truly reconciled to God. The meal where after thousands of years of estrangement, our Heavenly Father finally got to sit down and eat a meal with his kids. And it is the same meal that we eat today the meal that we call the Lord's Supper. Amen. Would you please bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. And we thank you even more for the love that motivated that grace. For the fact that long before we ever desired to share a meal with you. You had been longing to share a meal with us. That you eagerly desired, you wanted to rush to the place where you could be reconciled to us, to share fellowship and communion with us, to forgive us, to lead us into new life of covenant where we were made holy by your word and by your power. Father, you rushed to do that. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would make us children who surrender and rush back to you. Children who are eager to sit at the table with you and to be your kids. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our brother. Amen. We are going to close this morning uh, by singing the hymn, Be Still My Soul. Him be still my soul.
and sisters, may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be yours on account of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. May his hope guard you from all fear, and may his love fill your heart with joy. Go now in peace and serve your Lord. Amen.